This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back and we're live to... with Lou Pugliarisi. He's the CEO of EPRINC, an, an energy policy research uh, think tank in Washington, D.C. He joins us, and it's uh, after 9 o'clock at night, so we really appreciate that, Lou. And he's about to go on a trip to Nagoya. So can you talk about <laughs> Nagoya for a minute, Lou? So uh, uh, for the last seven years, all the world's producers and consumers of liquefied natural gas uh, meet in Japan. Usually it's Tokyo this year. They're going to meet in Nagoya, which is close to Tokyo. And they're going to be talking about uh, all the fundamental issues that need to be addressed to expand the production and uh, liquefaction of natural gas and then the development of regasification facilities throughout the Pacific. You know, it strikes me that you've been, you know, that in your energy career, your think, your energy think tank career, um, your the the trips you take are accelerating. You're you're traveling more. Exactly. You're, it's right. becoming more global than it was before. Am I it's right? It's becoming very global, and uh, it's becoming very well connected. You know, the communications are so. Yeah, part, people part. need to talk to you. Yeah. So let's talk about. Um, Gee, let's talk about what's so let, going on in, in terms of uh, yeah. tariffs and uh, other news. So I, I thought I'd put the North American Petroleum Renaissance in a little context in the international, how we're plugged into the international world and why it's important for us, uh, for our own, you know, uh, future uh, uh, expansion of our, particular of our petroleum sector, oil and natural gas, to uh, be connected into the world market. And by the way, I don't know if the news came out there in the Hawaiian Islands, but the U.S. for the second year in a row uh, had a reduction in its carbon emissions. And uh, all the European countries that have harassed us and uh, said we're such bad people are uh, accelerating their carbon emissions. So it's always interesting to watch it. So let me take a moment to ask you in a, in a, 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 as for a point on that. I mean, how, why? Why have the reason our for emissions that is, declined? So the reason for that is because we have cheap natural gas, and it's driving out coal. And, uh, and to some extent, it's also driving out in the consumer sector heating oil and and uh, uh, fossil fuels with higher carbon content. Mm. So this is so, a direct uh, result of the increase in photovoltaic? No. <laughs> the, photo, <laughs> the renewables have had no, virtually an unmeasurable amount of impact on this. That's how interesting. Uh, that's another, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, well, back to the point. I interrupted you. Please, please uh, tell so, us. Uh, tell let's, us. If we go to the, let, let's go to just see what's happening here. So if we go to the first slide, you see it has three pictures there, right? U.S. crude oil production, uh, U.S. lower 48 uh, dry gas or natural gas production, and natural gas liquids uh, production from natural gas processing. So that would be like propane, butane, um, and, and things like that. As you can see, the increase is very dramatic in all three categories. In fact, today the United States is the largest oil producer in the world and the largest natural gas producer in the world. Virtually unthinkable, right, mm -hmm. a few years ago. So it's a remarkable uh, expansion. And if you go to the next uh, picture, the next picture, right, uh, you can see in this next picture that uh, for natural gas, the red part of this graph, uh, which has now made the U.S. the largest uh, natural gas producer in the world, we're up to something like, uh, oh, well over 80, 85, 87 billion cubic feet a day. And that is driven largely by the shale gas revolution. And, you know, a lot of that's not just in Texas. The, the Appalachia region is the most, is the most cost effective in the world. Um, and in fact, uh, a funny thing happened last year because they, because the city of Boston could not get 
uh, within 100 miles of the city, Boston is some of the cheapest gas in the world, but they ran short and they had to import liquefied natural gas from Russia. <laughs> and the reason for that is because the good people of Massachusetts don't want to build a pipeline. They would rather have the Russians dig up the Sea of Azov and kill all the whales there, but okay, so, so that is an ongoing fight in the United States. But you can see we have a lot of gas. The problem, and we, the problem is we have so much gas, we have to start selling it to other people. We've sold about as much as we can to Mexico. And so one of the important uh, developments in the world is the, uh, the, the transmission of these exports as in liquefied form called liquefied natural gas. And it turns out one market that's quite important, if you go to the next slide, is uh, in China. And the next uh, picture shows the uh, rapid acceleration in natural gas use in China. Now, this gas is served both by pipeline exports from Eurasia and even uh, other parts, uh, Myanmar, but also the importation of liquefied of LNG, which the Chinese entered last year in a big way and began to, in fact, it was such a big entry that it, it uh, started to ramp up uh, LNG prices throughout the Pacific. Uh -huh. And what's interesting about this is that this is a political response to the Chinese people who want the government to take some action, not on climate, they don't even know what climate is, on local air pollution. And one thing natural gas is very good is it has no particulate. So you're going to see a lot of pressure in uh, China to get more gas supply. And they can buy this liquefied natural gas from a lot of sources, and they have been buying it from the U.S. And if you go to the next slide, you can see, I just want to give you a little bit more. <coughs> uh, unlike India, in which uh, coal still predominates, in, in China, gas is now the fuel of choice over coal. It's a big change in China. And as I say, it's driven very much by local air pollution concerns. And for the legitimacy of the party itself, they have to address this issue. It's the one area where the Chinese government is very much concerned about what the people think. Sure, pollution. I mean, a few years yeah. ago in Beijing, you had to wear a gas mask. That's how bad yeah, the yeah. air was. Now it's better. Yeah. And they're taking now, steps. You, yeah, a few years ago, everything was coal. You know, look at the yeah, Yangtze I, River and the coal barges going hither and yon. Uh, now it's not so much anymore, no? Yeah, so you can see the increase in use in power turbines, which is the, you know, the, the light, the, the, the bottom chart. And it's gone from, you know, 4 billion cubic feet a day to 8. Now, to put that, expected to get to 8 by 2023. By the way, to put that 4 billion cubic feet in perspective for 2015, that's how much gas we send to Mexico every day by pipeline. Mm-hmm. So Mexico is also making expansive use of U.S. Uh, natural gas, and we're very hopeful about that relationship as we now have a, uh, we now have a trade agreement with Mexico. Or at least we believe we do. Right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. We're still waiting to get Canada in the in the mix <laughs> here. Well, how how do the political diplomatic moves affect this, if at all? I mean, uh, we're, we're our relationship with China is not nearly as good as it was a few years ago. Um, our relationship with uh, Mexico and, and Canada, at least in terms of import-export, is not as good. Um, how does that affect uh, the so exportation I, 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 of LNG? Yeah, so I think you'll, so I'm going to show you a slide here which uh, deals with that. I think for Canada and Mexico, it's, we don't really have the whole story yet. The relationships are so strong. I haven't seen any disruption in the energy trade. However, the aluminum and steel import tariffs, much of which are now being sort of uh, negotiated, let's say, or trying to be resolved through the World Trade Organization. But though there have been uh, the, the, the actions the administration took under Section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act, which put tariffs on uh, aluminum and steel have not been helpful to the cost competitiveness of the industry. Mm. Uh, 
So if you go, and I think that if you go to the next uh, slide here, the next picture here, you can see. What, what is the title uh, of, the, of the slide? The next one is the, it shows the high export scenario and the low export scenario. Can you see that there? Yes. Okay. Okay. The, the colored part of the chart is really baked in. Okay. We are going to move to about, by 2021, we're going to be exporting in liquefied form uh, nearly 15 billion cubic feet a day of natural gas. That is a huge amount of gas and places us up one of the top tier uh, suppliers of liquefied natural gas to the world market. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Whether we, you know, how fast that ramps up uh, is going to depend a lot on, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the development of the technology, the size, and mostly the size of the market. We actually believe that Epic, that the price of natural gas is going to remain low in the U.S. Low, that is, somewhere from two seventy-five to three dollars and twenty-five cents a thousand cubic feet, and it's going to stay that way for many, many years. Mm -hmm. We am have I, so much gas. Am I right? Am I right to uh, assume that a, a country importing these exports from the United States? is not mm -hmm. going to want to put tariffs on LNG because uh, well, it needs the gas, no? Yeah, so I would say if you go to the last uh, picture here, LNG imports from the United States to China are, in fact, declining. China did sign up for a long-term agreement with one exporter called Chenier, and uh, they are the elephant in the room. Well, we just had a big uh, workshop on this with the Japanese, and, you know, the two big uncertainties in the Indo-Pacific market is going to be China and India. India, we sort of understand, but China, small changes in policy there can overwhelm the world LNG market. So we have to really be, we actually have to find a way to engage the Chinese so we understand the process and that we understand how to address this kind of huge requirement they're gonna have. But I think what's telling is that the trade policy, the trade dispute with China is starting to have an effect. And if you look at the red, the sort of red parts of the bar, those are Chinese imports from the United States. Let's see that slide LNG. one more time with the, uh, yeah, yeah, the red parts. Of LNG, the, yeah, go ahead. LNG imports from USA to China are declining is the title of this slide, okay. Okay, that's the wrong slide. Let's look at the other slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's the last slide. Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. So you see the red bar and the larger bar there. Mm -hmm. And the along the bottom are all the countries the U.S. is shipping liquefied natural gas to. And uh, in as we enter 2008, you can see it's starting to decline and flatten out. Yes. Clearly, the Chinese are sending a message. Okay. They are trying to find other sources. They're trying to find levers uh, to the U.S., to the Trump administration that says, look, this trade policy has two sides to it. And it's not just us going after your soybean exports. We're going to go after a central theme in your administration, which is energy dominance. And we're going to show you that we can find supplies of LNG from sources other than the United States. We don't want to be dependent on the United States. Uh, well, I don't think they, you know, they have a huge source. They have their domestic production. They have, they have supplies from Russia, from Eurasia. So they have a diversified strategy. But they also want to be able to send a signal that trade is a two-way street as far as they're concerned. Mm -hmm. now, I think the Trump administration's view is that they have to do this because of certain other, quote, unfair practices on the Chinese, particularly a combination of requirement of technology transfer or some technology theft. And that I, I actually I'm quite concerned about this because, you know, my, our strategy, I mean, if if I were king, I would say, look, you should have a strong trade relationship with Canada, the Europeans, Mexico, 
And then you should gang up as a group on the Chinese. <laughs> Don't try to take on everybody at once. It's, it's a huge, it's a huge burden, and you're not likely to succeed. <laughs> and it bites you. One, one more thing yeah. before we go to the break, right. Ruben, is that that chart yeah. that we just looked at shows yeah. that this process of um, you know China looking for other, uh, other LNG elsewhere and taking mm. less from the U.S. started in 2008. So its, its strategy really goes back when? To two, that was long before Trump. Um, no, 2018. The, the slide, if you look at the slide, it's only from the years 2017 to 2018. Ah, uh, okay. I haven't pulled it up there yet. Yeah. I see it now. Okay. So this really yeah, is very recent then, yes. Yeah, this is very real-time data here. Actually, the LNG market wasn't much of a market 10 years ago. It was Japan, Japan, Korea, Taiwan. That was it. Well, it looks, it, to me, at the end, at the end of it, at the final yeah. part of the slide, that the amount of gas that the Chinese are getting from other sources is greater than the amount of gas they're importing from the U.S. No? Exactly. And this is just LNG. They're getting lots of gas from a pipeline from Myanmar and from Russia. And then they get fairly big supplies from uh, Turkmenistan and Eurasia. And does this mean that they have put money into infrastructure, which is dedicated to those other sources? I mean, is this reversible or is this a sort of a permanent condition? Oh, no, I, I, I'm pretty sure the LNG stuff is very reversible because right now they're just swapping out one LNG supplier from another. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I do think, though, long term, it could cause them to sh fundamentally shift uh, their sub their sources of supply. Sure, on a momentum basis, anyway. Right, right. Well, let's take a short break. That's uh, Lou Pugliarisi. We're going to come back and talk about more of the things that are happening in Washington, and plenty is happening in Washington these days. We'll be right back. <laughs> this is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. When I was growing up. I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger. And hungry mornings make tired days. Grumpy days. Bleh kind of days. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. When we're not hungry for breakfast, we're hungry for more. More ideas. More dreams. More fun. When kids aren't hungry for breakfast, they can be hungry for more. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. Hello. My name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pamai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. <laughs> okay, Lupu Yurisi, we're having a good time during the break. <laughs> So, Lou, you know, we got, we got all kinds of stuff happening in Washington, and in, in a sense, yeah. you, you are our, our man in Washington, can I say that? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure. always interested in your view of how things are going in Washington, yeah. and, and clearly one of the biggest things going now, aside from, you know, today's action on, on, on tariffs, um, is, is Judge Kavanaugh. Um, can you, can you uh, give me a feeling about what the, the rank and file feel? about what's happening with Judge Kavanaugh's confirmation? Well, I, you know, I think you have to look upon this. You know, there's a kind of substantive issue. And I do think now with the so-called Me Too movement, uh, for whatever that's worth, that it's a very hot potato for any politician, right? Everybody panics when this starts to happen. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> but I, I do think that Judge Kavanaugh's getting... I mean, I, I don't, I'm not in a position to talk about the merits, although I do think that um, this happened a long time ago. It doesn't mean it's not serious. It happened when he was, I mean, the FBI today said, look, they want us to invest. I mean, I think there's a lot of confusing statements coming out. The FBI said, well, uh, actually, you don't understand what we do. We go out and interview people. We write down what they tell, them, tell us, and we send it to the White House. And said, okay, it's, it's your decision. And the Senate is supposed to be the place that makes the judgment. So I'm pretty sure that what's going on is, you know, Schumer and your Senator Haroni and uh, Harona and uh, 
Gildebrand, and all the, the Democrats, they just want this thing to get delayed in the hope that in the, uh, in the election, that somehow the Democrats take the Senate and then they can, they can stop the nomination. And uh, I, I just think it was, for me, a little outrageous that Dianne Feinstein sat on this document she had, this anonymous letter she had, and then she waited until all the hearings were over and then released it. <laughs> That's pretty crafty. <laughs> pretty crafty. It's very hardball, you know, but I don't think it's... Uh... Actually, I'm sort of thinking the guy's going to probably get confirmed. I mean... You know, I think the other thing that comes out in all these Me Too things like Weinstein and uh, Matt Lauer, usually there's like dozens of women who showed up. There hasn't been a single woman who said that this is a bad guy. So, I mean, I, uh, you know, there should be a statute of limitations on how far, far. Actually, you know that when the FBI does a background check on somebody, they stop at 18. <laughs> you mean year, 18 years of, of age? Yeah, they don't go before the age of 18. It's just a matter of FBI policy. <laughs> well, you know, this is a message to all those 17-year-olds out there. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> what they do on a Saturday night may affect the rest of their lives, <laughs> like it or not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so I, I, you know, I, and I, I do think it's a terrible way. Look, I get it. They're unhappy with this guy. You know, they wanted a lot more documents from him. But he's settled over 360, I mean, he's, he's written an opinion and been involved in 360 cases from the bench. So are you telling me we can't figure out whether, how this guy comes out by looking at 360 cases? They've never had that much before yet. <laughs> but, uh, and so it's really, you have to see it as a circus it is, you know, when you watch it. Did you say circus? Because I used that term earlier today. <laughs> Yes, it was. It is a circus, right? Except well, if it <laughs> shows you, it shows you. The cage. You used the term <laughs> hardball before, and yeah, indeed, yeah. that that seems applicable on both sides of the aisle. Uh, that everybody's playing hardball, and it really has n not a lot to do with the substance. <laughs> it has to do with playing the game. Yeah. I mean, I thought the good senator from Hawaii who said today that this is really a problem men have. And that they, men have to step up. So that's like 50% of her bloating, boating, boating block she went after. <laughs> well, this is a kind of an intersection between Supreme Court confirmation and the Me Too movement. Let's see right. what happens when you smash the two of them together. Right, so exactly, what's your prediction exactly. in terms of timing and result? So my prediction is that the Republicans... This is a big deal for Senator McConnell, majority leader. This is the one thing he can point to. It means a lot to his legacy. It fires up the Republican base. I mean, actually, this could backfire on the Democrats in the election because might, it might get all these Republicans who, are gonna, who they hope will stay home, come out. So I believe Kavanaugh will be concurred. I just think the guy, they just don't have anything. They have these huge... You know, Bush came out for him again today. There's so many people. He had 65 women from his high school talk about what a great guy he was. I just, I mean, I do think, I do think you have to take these allegations seriously. It is a problem, but it was so long ago. You don't know if it's an implanted memory. She didn't. It's, didn't, it's nothing she revealed till she was 2012. You know, it's very interesting. She's represented by the same lawyer who represented Bill Clinton against Juanita Broderick in the... In the it's so a, it's, it's a specialty got, area. Right, but it's got too much political, you know... But you know, you know what's troubling between. about this, Lou, and I, I'm interested in your thought about it, is that <clears throat> let's assume for the moment that she has enough, and maybe that's one of the reasons she wants to see an FBI probe, uh, she has enough to be credible that something untoward happened, uh, even though yeah. they were just kids. Something untoward happened. Yeah. He, on the other hand, is saying pretty, pretty clearly that he is denying anything happened. Okay, and yeah, he, he, he said he wasn't even in the room. Yeah. He so said he, he wasn't he, in the room. He denies it all. And then you have right. that fellow, the friend, you know, who says, well, there was something. Um, 
And, and who knows you know, where additional information will go? Who knows how it will present when you put people under oath in front of that committee on this exactly. issue? Exactly. But, but, but my, my, my concern I mean, is if the Senate finds the committee, you know, let's assume the committee finds that she's right, that she, she is more likely to be believed, that she is the credible one, then they're also inherently finding that he's not telling the truth. Isn't that true? And then that's I a think problem. It turn, I tur look, if it turns out that he lied, right, then he should not be confirmed. It's very straightforward. Mm -hmm. But he's pretty adamant about this, that he was not there. And, uh, and here's the problem. Can you remember anything about what you were doing 36 years ago? I can. I don't have a diary I can look up and see what I was doing. She can't remember the day, the year. You know, it's pretty. I think this is really very problematic. Yeah, yeah. This well, it's got the play out, and it's yeah. and it's woven into how how the midterm elections will go. I mean, there's a exactly. direct it's connection. All, unfortunately, it's all about politics. Yeah. So let me ask you this. This it sort of takes us to my last question. The midterm yeah. elections, they could, you know, confirm the Republican position in Congress and they could upset the Republican position in Congress. And maybe it's a, a tight race in that way. How does that race affect energy? How does it affect LNG? How does it affect energy in America? Do you lie awake at night thinking about how this is going to change the world in energy? No, you know, it's very interesting. I bet you didn't read about this in the paper. Two weeks ago, the Department of Interior had an oil and gas lease sale in New Mexico, right? Not Mexico, New Mexico. And the sum of the high bids, that means the money people were willing to pay, was about a billion dollars. Yet you didn't read about that anywhere. So in terms of energy policy, a change on the Congress is not going to change it that much. If the House goes to Democratic control, which is you know probably at least 50-50, maybe slightly more. There's going to be lots of hearings, lots of oversight and investigation hearings. Lots of people are going to be brought up there and yelled at, and they're going to request a lot of things. But basically, the administration's not looking for any new legislation. So they'll be able to continue on the road they go forward. Um, they may impeach Trump. I don't think that's on it, but... They won't get very far unless the Senate shifts dramatically. Mm -hmm. And the most likely political forecast is that the House moves to a slightly Democratic uh, majority and the Senate stays where it is or gets slightly more, Republi more Republican. And if that's all so, that, I, I get what you're saying. That doesn't but mean there'll be, be new initiatives to renew uh, an environmental an environmental no. uh, you know, change. We're on, well, yeah, we may be, you know, we're reducing our carbon emissions every year now. I don't know what the problem is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, it's we'll have to Germans. follow it. It's, it's the Germans who shut down their nukes and are now digging up coal in an ancient forest. I mean, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> While they're harassing us for being bad you know, stewards of the environment. <laughs> it's all connected, Lou. It's all connected, and we have to follow it. So, so in two weeks' time, I am certain, to a moral certainty, there'll be more for us to discuss. Oh, let's hope so. Let's hope so. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Lou Pugliarisi. <laughs> Energy in America, Lou Pugliarisi. Thanks so much. Aloha. <laughs>